benefits of you asking questions and answering it. By the way, if I call your name and you wear WBSU gear, make sure you let me know. So you can get your small amount of extra credit. The map is here. Smith. Davis. Mark is not here yet. Newton, I think he's online. Coulter. Morning. Questions while we well, other than about the stuff that's on the board, so I'm gonna do the normal announcements and reminders. Decide to take a picture or if you're in the fiction time, like point at it. It's not very obvious. Not that you have to take a picture. It's a little extra credit. It's a little bit more extra credit if you do.
start with announcements as usual. Remind you, today is lab. Lab is important. It's a lot less uh, easygoing as lecture, meaning you have to be there. You cannot miss lab and get points, right? Don't like here, you can watch the video, right? So make sure you're in that lab. Um, if you miss it, you just, in best credit or best case scenario, you'll get half credit for your lab. That means if you miss it and you somehow get in touch with your classmates and get the data and do it and, and get all the questions right, you'll get half credit, right? Um, if you come in late, leave early, mostly coming in late is the bigger deal, you'll also get partial credit. Right? You'll get points taken away from being late. It's very important because usually it's a team effort. And usually, you know, sometimes it's um, a safety precaution. So you need to be here for the pre-lab lecture, one, again, for the safety precaution, and two, because you need to know what you're doing, because if it's a team effort, it's not fair for everybody else to have to wait on you, because you have no idea what's going on, because you came in like, we're good? All right, so make sure you come to lab. If you haven't done the pre-lab yet, you know, technically it's overdue. Um, so, you know, when you do it, you're only going to get partial credit for it. But I will say this, if you do it before we get to lab today, it'll be worth more than if you do it after we get to lab today. Does that make sense? Because again, the free lab's there to help you prepare for the lab. So yeah, make sure you get that done if you haven't already. Um, and again, it's at noon, don't be late. Make sure you're there on time. Plan to be there the whole time to move to 150, but probably won't be there that long. But just in case, don't go making a lunch date at like 145, okay? All right, any questions about lab? All right, if you need help doing it too, sorry, I'm beating a dead horse here, but a lot of you guys didn't even do the free labs, so worry. If you need help, let me know. Labs aren't a test. So if you just want, like, if you just want to be there online with me as you do it step by step, question for question, then you want me to walk you through it, hold your hand, I'm fine with that. I'm here to teach you, not test you. Anyway, office hours. I mind you, on Friday, my office hours are going to be online. Just as a reminder. So I won't physically be on campus this Friday. I will be online for office hours. Google Classroom. I know I keep saying this, but until until things continue or until things uh, get better, I'm going to keep saying it. Read the announcements. I'm telling you, I know so many of you aren't reading the announcements carefully. And once you do, you'll realize how I know. It's like, oh, yeah, I've been doing this the whole time. So, yeah, read the announcements. It's important. It's there for your grade. You guys are leaving points on the table and you're not being prepared. Any questions about Google Classroom? All right. Exam one. I think we go ahead and make a date on this one. I know I said I was going to um, have us vote. But if you remember from the Google Classroom announcements, uh, next Friday was going to be an online day anyway. Like I was going to teach online and not in person because I've got some something scheduled. So because of that, for sure, we're just going to go ahead and do the exam next Friday. So not this coming Friday, but a week from this coming Friday is when the exams are. Since we're going to be online anyway, I figured that's the perfect time to do the exam. So sometime between now and then, or sometime between after we finish chapter three and uh, do the exam, I'm going to hold an exam review online. I don't know what time yet. It'll be whatever time you guys want to do it. It will not be mandatory because it won't be during class time. But if you do come, you'll get extra credit. I'm also going to make a video of it. If you watch the video, you'll get extra credit. So I'll talk a little bit more about the exam review when it gets there. And then the final thing to say about the exam, even though I'm going to keep saying this between now and next Friday, if you want more time than 50 minutes to take it, contact me so we can start, we can figure out a time for you to take it. You know, outside of regular time where I can watch you and watch your screen and make sure you're not using an open book. Um, any questions about the exam? Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Study guys are already on Google Classroom. That's what I use to write the exams, so I'll go ahead and do them. And then finally, attendance. Just to remind you, today's WBSU Wednesdays. So if you're wearing it, you already got the extra credit. If you want to take part in a picture, um, then you know, after class and you have time, then you get a little bit more extra credit. And then after I post it, if you tag yourself and or share it, you get even more extra credit. So, and then also the first word for attendance today will be football. Any questions about any of that stuff? Okay, let's jump back into it then. Chapter three, the last of the three chapters for exam one, right? Here's what we've covered so far. This first main bullet point was organic compounds, and it was kind of like all the background information you needed to understand the most the more important part of the chapter. And the more important part of the chapter is the big four, I don't call it the big four, because when I say the big four, I'm usually referring to oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, yeah. That's what I usually talk about. This is different. This is the large biological molecules that you need to know. So 
So for the exam, you'll need to know the difference between carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and nucleic acids. You're going to need to know the monomer of carbohydrates and the polymer of carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and nucleic acids, right? So the exam is going to be a lot of, is it a carb or is it a protein, right? That kind of thing. So with that in mind, we started talking about carbohydrates first. And we broke carbohydrates themselves down into three categories. Monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Um, we already finished talking about monosaccharides. And to remind you, the most important thing about that little bullet point is that monosaccharides are the monomer of carbohydrates. Because remember, like I said, you need to know the monomer and you need to know the polymer. So monosaccharide is the monomer of carbohydrates. That's the one we just finished talking about. Somebody asked a great question. They answered the, they answered the attendance questions. Um, and one of their questions at the end, a little extra credit thing, was what are the different monosaccharides? And well, the reason I think that's a great question is because it's a good time for me to remind you, you don't need to know it. Like we, I talked about glucose and fructose and galactose and maltose, all those different monosaccharides, you don't need to know all of them. You don't need to know any of them. Just know that monosaccharides are the um, monomers of carbohydrates. So any questions about that? Good, great question. Um, then we got into disaccharides. Actually, <coughs> how far did we get from that? Let me pull this up. Disaccharides. Yeah, we started talking about this. Again, I was giving you some examples. So here's sucrose, here's lactose, here's maltose. Just like I was saying with the, with the monosaccharides, you don't need to know all these different ones. Those are just some examples. You don't need to know them. This is a 100-level course. It's not important. Here's a video I introduced you to, didn't show you, but again, it's basically two things coming together, which as you should know from the beginning of the chapter, that's called the dehydration reaction. Again, this is just an example. You don't need to know that lactose is made up of glucose and galactose. You don't need to know that. We already talked about this. We also talked about this, where you can find some of this. You can find lactose and beer, all these things I already listed. But again, you don't need to know all that. If anything, if you know any disaccharides, at least just know sucrose. Because sucrose is the one that's probably most common in our everyday lives, and that's table sugar. So when most people outside of biology use the word sugar, that's probably what they're talking about is sucrose. So because it's more common in our everyday lives, that makes it at least slightly more important for the exam. Anyway, any questions about this slide? I think this is where we left off. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about sucrose. Not that you need to know this part, but this first bullet point here, sucrose is the main carbohydrate in plant sap. So when a plant has you know, sap like maple syrup or sugar cane, if it's sticky and wet, which is what sap is, it's usually sucrose. Again, you don't need to know that for the example. And that brings us to something called high fructose corn syrup. How many of you guys have ever heard of that? There's a Pepsi out here, of course it's gray. Is it diet or regular? Uh, yeah. That's what I drink too. But, <laughs> oh well. So it's not going to have that. But if you were to look at the first ingredient of most sodas that aren't diet, that's probably it. Meaning that's probably what it's most of, or maybe it's water. But anyway, there's a lot of it. But what is high fructose corn syrup? This is for your own information because, again, it's everyday life. So that makes it slightly important, but it won't be on the exam. High fructose corn syrup is made by a commercial process that converts glucose, which is that one monosaccharide, right? This isn't a disaccharide yet. It converts the glucose that's found in corn syrup to match something sweeter, which is called fructose. And remember, I showed you at the beginning of uh, yesterday, excuse me, the beginning of Monday, I showed you a picture of glucose, I showed you a picture of fructose, and I said, <coughs> these two things are isomers. And I said, that's because they have the same chemical formula, but a different structure. I said, because they have a slightly different structure, they have a slightly different function. And I said, fructose is actually sweeter than glucose. So that is why. One of the reasons why they use high fructose corn syrup and things like soft drinks and other processed foods. But it's also cheaper. So anyway, that's all for your own information. I'm not going to test you on it. Any questions about this slide? All right, here's just kind of a picture, a really, really basic flow chart to show you how it's made. All right, so here you have corn, right? So they extract the starch out of that. And as you're going to learn a little bit later, starch is nothing but a bunch of glucose that's put together. So they break that down, take that individual glucose, do something to change it into its isomer, which is fructose, which is sweeter, cheaper, and then there you go. Again, you don't need to know that for your for the exam. But are there any questions? All right. Um, 
Here's something you could look into if you're wanting to for independent work, especially if you're into health at all, health and fitness or diet. Why is fructose, especially high fructose uh, corn syrup, why is it so much worse than sugar? So we know why they use it. We know that it's cheaper and sweeter. But if you're curious, you can look that up for independent work. Why is it so much worse for your health? Or how? And that could be a free sentence paper if you want. I was wondering why it was so why it's so bad for your health. According to cornsyrupsucks.com, it's bad because it makes your hair fall out, which isn't true, but it really could be that short of a paper. Or if you read it and it's interesting, you want to elaborate, go for it. Anyway, here's some more information you don't necessarily need, but it's in your book, so I included it. And when I say you don't need it, you don't need it for your exam. This is good for your everyday life. The average American co consumes about 130 pounds of table sugar per year, or sugar. That includes high fructose corn syrup and regular table sugar. That's a lot. Uh, I think so, anyway. And that's another thing you can look into. The average American consumes that much, but even me, like I probably consume a lot, probably not that much, but I don't eat sweets. And I never put sugar in anything. That just goes to show you, like, sugar is put into stuff. Like, um, ketchup has a lot of sugar in it. Um, a lot of uh, barbecue sauces have a lot of sugar put into it. Speaking of which, that'll be the second word for attendance, barbecue sauce. Anyway, so Americans eat a lot of it. That's another thing you can look up if you want for uh, independent work, too. Why not? What about other countries? How does America compare to other countries? What's their average? Um, anyway, so all this stuff is bad. It's a major cause of tooth decay, as you can see right here, and overconsumption. It increases the risk of type 2 diabetes and heart disease, and they are empty calories. So right? all calories are not created to take people. Like, we need calories to live, but if you're taking in calories, hopefully they also have some nutrients to it. Like vitamins, fiber, protein, which we're about to talk about, things like that. Anyway, again, none of this will be on the exam. So are there any questions about disaccharides? For the exam, again, the biggest thing you need to know for disaccharides, just to remind you, remind you is that disaccharides, disaccharides are made up of two monosaccharides, right? That's important to know. Know that disaccharides are one of the three categories of carbohydrates. And that's basically it for disaccharides. And again, maybe know that table sugar is a disaccharide and it's called sucrose. All right, there's no questions. We will move on to the third and final category of carbohydrates anyway, which are polysaccharides. I know that's hard to read, but that's what we're going through next. So if a monosaccharide is one, or one sugar molecule and a disaccharide is two sugar molecules, what do you think a polysaccharide might be? Yeah, three or more, right? That's actually usually not three, but three or more, well, that would suffice. When we started this chapter, I showed you a picture of a plate of spaghetti and a soda next to it. And I said, all right, we're going to talk about carbs. What do you think? What do you see here? What's the carbs? And somebody correctly said um, the, the, the pasta. So this is where we're getting at. Usually when people think about carbs and they're not sitting in a biology class, usually they're thinking about polysaccharides. Technically, polysaccharides are what we call complex carbs or complex carbohydrates. You should know that from the exam. Not necessarily because I'm asking you or I'm going to ask you, but because on the exam I might refer to it as a polysaccharide, or I might refer to it as a complex carb, or I might refer to it as a complex carbohydrate. So you just need to know those words as far as we're concerned or interchangeable. Like I already said earlier, they are long chains of sugars, meaning You've got the monosaccharide, like glucose, very often. If you just string a bunch of them together, like a pearl necklace or like a train with all those carbs, right? That's the polysaccharide. That's the polymer. So again, now you know for carbohydrates in general. To remind you, the monosaccharide, excuse me, the monomer of carbohydrates are monosaccharides. Polymer, nice and easy. Polymers are called polysaccharides. Right there in the name. Any questions about this? We're going to talk a little bit more about um, polysaccharides. But there's no questions about this slide, and we will move forward. The next slide I'm going to show you um, this is an animation, so I'm not going to you know, show you the animation, but if you want to, you can watch it. It shows uh, polysaccharides coming together. 
in, guess what? Uh, dehydration reactions, right? So once you bring things together, build large, large molecules, as you already know, those are dehydration reactions. Here's a big one. Here's a big polysaccharide. You need to know this. So there's different types of polysaccharides. The first one we're going to talk about is starch. So first of all, you need to know that starch is a polysaccharide. Of course, a polysaccharide is one of the three categories of carbohydrates that we talked about. And before we get into talking about sort of starch, I'll just go ahead and tell you now, there's two other polysaccharides that we talked about. So for the exam, you need to know the difference between starch and the other two. So keep that in mind as you're learning about starch. Some of these things I'm going to teach you make it unique from the other stuff. This first one, I'll go ahead and put it next to it, not because it's not important, but because as far as what makes starch unique from the other ones that I'm about to teach you, that doesn't make it unique. So yes, it is a long string of glucose molecules. It's a bunch of glucose to put together. But that does not make it unique. So are the other three, or the other two. Here's where it gets unique, and you need to know this for the exam. Starch is used by plants to store energy. So again, I don't know if you were shorthanding, you could put starch equals plant energy, or plant energy storage, something like that. Because no, none of the other two that I'm going to teach you are used by plants for energy. So that would be shorthand enough, starch. Plants, energy. Those three words that go together in your brain. Where do we get some of it? Well, we get it from potatoes, grains, major uh, sources of starch, right? So wheat, rice, all that stuff. I'm also going to put it next to that because this is not a nutrition class. So I'm not going to waste one of my 50 questions asking you where to get starch, especially considering you probably already know. But again, if you're interested in this kind of thing, that's another independent work topic. Obviously, potatoes and grains are a major source of starch, but what else? What are the other major sources of starch? And, I don't know, America eats mostly which one? And I don't know, I'd like to know the answer to that. Asia, you know, pick a different country in Asia, maybe. Usually, uses, uses what? I would guess rice. That's my hypothesis. Anyway, any questions about this slide? To remind you, this, may, this bullet point right here, is the most important as far as the exam is concerned. When you think of starch, you should think plant energy. And yes, technically it's storing energy, because when they're ready to use the energy, they break down those little glucose monomers and use those individually, but that's all. Right. Here's a picture of starch. Each one of these little rings right here, that's a glucose, that's a glucose, that's a glucose, that's a glucose, right? It's just a bunch of glucose linked together. So again, the glucose, that's the monosaccharide, that's the monomer. Those things are all linked to each other to make the polymer, the polysaccharide. All right, so that is what starch is. Again, starch, plant, energy, storage. You can see its structure, right? Now here's another one you need to know. Now look at the structure of the starch before I go to the next, next slide. Here we go, next slide. Look at that, glycogen. Doesn't that look a lot like starch? Yeah, yeah it's a very similar starch. <laughs> Instead of being one long strand, this one happens to branch out. I'm going to even talk about that in this class. But you can see that it has a similar structure. Therefore, it must have a similar what? It has a similar structure to starch. It must have a similar what to starch? Function. Great. And it does. So that being said, and I mean, this is slightly different, right? Because it is also slightly different. Uh, structure, so it's a slightly different function. But we know that starch is basically energy storage for plants. Now I'm introducing you to glycogen, and you can see what it looks like. So I'm telling you right now, it already has a similar function. Any guesses to what the function for glycogen might be? Stor yeah, perfect. Storing energy for animals. Great. That is exactly right. It is used by animals to store energy. And as far as the exam is concerned, that's probably the most important thing you need to know. Good job. Where is it stored? Not that you need to know for the exam, but for your own knowledge, it is stored mostly in the liver and the muscle cells. Obviously, you need it in the muscle cells because your muscles are going to need energy, right? But also, when you don't have it in your muscle cells, 
a very basic way we can say it comes from the liver, but this is not anatomy and physiology class, so I won't get into that. You can look into it if you want for uh, independent work if you want. How does it go from the liver to where you need it, which is your muscles? Anyway, yeah. So just like just like starch, you know, when we need energy, we break it down, right? So those are a bunch of glucose. Glucose is what we need when we need energy. So we'll pluck one off, pluck one off, pluck one off, right? I mean, not literally. That's not physically how that happens, but generally that's what's going on here. Taking off glucose and using it for energy. So the protein is in our muscles that we eat by we eat meat. Good question. Yes, but remember, we haven't talked about protein yet. We're going to talk about protein. All right. So, so a better way to say that maybe, if I'm understanding correctly, is our muscles, you should think of, when you think of our muscles, you should think of protein. But you also keep in mind they are regular old cells, so they do have the other stuff too. They do have lipids and um, carbohydrates and nucleic acids. So yeah, you should associate muscles with protein, but just keep in mind, obviously they also have these other things. Yeah, great question. So yeah. When people say they're carbo loading, like we were talking about earlier, if you're about to run a marathon or half marathon and you eat a big old spaghetti dinner the night before, that's what it's for, right? So you eat it, you eat all that starch, your body puts it into your livers, basically, and then once you need it on that long run, then it starts coming out of your liver and starts going to your cells as glucose. And again, there's words for that too. There's nomenclature. That's called something. That process is called something. If you want to look it up for, um, for uh, independent work, feel free. Any questions about glycogen? All right, so I've introduced you to the first two of the three types of polysaccharides. So here we go, the last one, cellulose. This is an interesting one, and I introduced you to this unofficially on Monday. I mentioned it, but it wasn't on the slide, so it was all new information. Now I'm officially introducing you to this term. You need to know what cellulose is, and you need to know it is the most abundant organic compound on earth. Basically, it's the stuff that gives plant cells its structure. So again, shorthand, if you're just studying, if you were to make flashcards, starch is plant energy storage. Glycogen, animal energy storage. Cellulose, plant cell structure. Right? Those are the three things. If you just remember that, you're good for the exam. Your book kind of explains how it happens. It says that the cellulose forms these cable-like fibrils in the plant cell walls. I'm going to put it next to that just to help you focus when you're studying. I mean, yeah, that's true, but you don't need to know that much detail. Um, I'm going to put a question mark next to this. I don't know if you necessarily need to know that for the exam, but it's true. Cellulose cannot be broken down by enzymes produced by animals. And you guys don't know what enzymes yet are yet. So let me rephrase this. Animals can't digest cellulose, yet it is the most abundant organic compound on Earth. So since we can't digest it, you might think it's a bad thing, but it is actually kind of a good thing because, and this is another shorthand thing you could write down, hopefully you know this for the exam, because I might use this word, cellulose is also known as fiber. And I'm sure you guys know that the foods that are high in fiber are good for you. And that's one of the reasons why. It cannot be broken down by the enzymes in your guts, in your stomach. So instead of breaking it down into those little glucose, it stays in these long cable-like fibrils, and it basically cleans you out. It helps keep your system clean. Anyway, any questions about this slide? We're still going to talk about cellulose, so I just want to make sure there's no more questions on this slide before we move on. All right. Um, oh wait, this is still the same slide. So I found it on, on the internet once and I saved it. What's in your fast food? First of all, before I get into this, let me say this. Fast food is obviously bad for you. I'm not here to advocate for fast food. You should probably stay away from it. It's not good for you. That being said, this is it. The, the point here is this is how people try to trick you with science. Number three, it says that you have wood in your fast food. What's in your fast food? Wood, parentheses, cellulose. And most of the people who lie to you about science, like I said many times, usually they do it by telling you some kind of thing that's the truth, but just doing it out of context, or telling you a bunch of true things and then building a false um, conclusion. In this case, they're just telling you something that's true in a scary way. They're saying that wood slash cellulose is in your fast food, and it's not. A more accurate thing to say is that wood is made of cellulose, 
but also so is uh, you know you got some in your that lettuce right there and the tomatoes right it's plant stuff it's plant material it's good for you that part is good for you so yes people will try to scare you that way anyway any questions about that all right here's what cellulose looks like it should look really familiar right it's a long chain of glucose molecules just like starch just like um, glycogen the only difference is remember the glucose or the, excuse me the starch kind of zigzag like this Sort of the glycogen, except it has branching patterns. This is just a straight line. And for whatever reason, because it's in a straight line and has a different shape, one well, of the enzymes that we have, it cannot digest it. It cannot break these bonds. So again, that's what makes it good for us. I will point this out. You do not need to know the different structures. Right? So I'm not going to show you a picture like this right here and then tell it, say, which one's glycogen, which one's cellulose, which one's starch. I'm not going to do that with the but here's a handy little table I made for you that does have all the information you need to know for the exam. Because remember, for the exam, you're going to need to know the difference between starch, glycogen, and cellulose. Uh, most importantly, right here, right, these bottom parts. Starch, plant, energy storage. Glycogen, animal, energy storage. Cellulose, plant, structure. Nice and easy, right? Any questions? All right, um, another independent work topic. I've only, ta I've only taught you starch, glycogen, and cellulose. There are many, many other polysaccharides. You can look into them if you want. What are the other ones? You could just put a list, or you could talk about them. This is chitin. According to my source, chitin comes from this, and it's used for that. You know, whatever, whatever the case may be. Anyway, this next picture I'm going to show you is also important. It's again just the structure. It just shows you what they look like, but now it just shows all three of them together. So, no big deal there. Any questions about carbohydrates in general? So we're now done with carbohydrates. And to remind you, carbohydrates are one of the four types of bio biological molecules, so you need to know the difference between carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. You need to know the carbohydrate, but the monomer is monosaccharides, and the polymer is polysaccharides, and you need to know Three different types of carbs, which are monosaccharide, disaccharide, and polysaccharide. So, there's no questions about carbohydrates. Let's talk about lipids. You guys are probably very familiar with them already. You just might not know. Before we talk about lipids, let me introduce you to a new word and also back it up a little bit. First of all, all these things we just got finished talking about, carbohydrates, they are called hydrophilic, meaning water loving. So when you put a carb in water, in general, it dissolves, right? Because it's, that's just the way those molecules work. That's the chemistry of those molecules. They dissolve in water. That's hydrophilic. Lipids are the opposite. Lipids are hydrophobic, meaning they don't dissolve in water. And you need to know that for the exam. First of all, you need to know what those two words mean. Second of all, you need to know that carbs are hydrophilic. Third, you need to know that lipids are hydrophobic. Of course, the lipids being hydrophobic, that's probably going to be easy to remember. Surely you've seen you know, oil in water, right? It doesn't mix. And this is a good example. This is oil and vinegar. And vinegar is not water, but it is hydrophilic. So you have a hydrophobic thing and a hydrophilic thing. They don't mix. Of course, if you shake them up really hard, then it seems like it mixes. And it kind of does. There's a word for it. It's called emulsify. So what happens is you actually get tiny little individual droplets of oil that are mixed up in the vinegar. But eventually, those things get back together and they separate. So it's not truly mixed. The oil never dissolves in the water. It just emulsifies. So you need to know that. But anyway, yeah. You don't need to know about oil and vinegar for the exam. That bullet point in that picture, hopefully, is just to help you remember. All right. Oils or lipids are hydrophobic. Anyway, any questions about this slide? So if you remember, before we even started talking about the four categories, proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids, before we talked about that, I introduced you to a word called macromolecules. And I said that, that word's not going to be important, but technically macromolecules are monomers made of polymers. And I said the only ones that are fall in that category are carbs, which we've already talked about, nucleic acids, and proteins. And I said the only one that's different are lipids. Don't need to know this, but I'm just reminding you of this. 
Lipids are different from carbohydrates, they're different from proteins, they're different from nucleic acids, because they are not technically macromolecules. And technically they are not polymers, because the polymer is built from repeating monomers, right? So the carbohydrates you just learned about, those are repeating glucose monomers, right? Glucose, 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 that's all that was. Now the lipids are made up of other molecules, but it's not like repeating the same monomer. So technically because of that, these things are not macromolecules. Nonetheless, well, I mean, before I say that, so you now know that when you take the test, I'm not going to ask you what is the monomer of a lipid and what is the polymer of a lipid, because technically there are no monomers of polymers. However, they are still made up of different building blocks, and I will ask you what makes up these different types of lipids. And we'll get to that here in a second. So are there any questions about this slide? Again, if you're writing anything down, this is nothing to write down. This is more of an introduction. This is just me saying, technically, they're built from different parts. And yes, you're going to need to know the different parts for the exam. But technically, these different parts are not monomers coming together to make polymers. All right, let's get into it. As far as we're concerned, there are two types of lipids. And just like you need to know the difference between the three types of carbohydrates, you're going to need to know the difference between the two types of lipids which are fats, which is almost impossible to read there, and steroids. No need to write that down because we're going to talk about them individually. But a typical fat, first of all, let me say this, again, more vocabulary. You could write fat, if you're taking notes and like the shorthand things, fat equals triglyceride. So those words are interchangeable in this conversation. I might call it a fat, I might call it a triglyceride. As far as we're concerned in this conversation, it's the same thing. Anyway, where are they made from? You do, you do need to know this, just like you need to know what makes up uh, polysaccharides. You need to know that fats or triglycerides are made up of a glycerol molecule joined with three fatty acid molecules. And that's kind of in the name. That's where you get the triglyceride, right? So that if you can remember glyceride and glycerol, then you're good. Because on this multiple choice exam, I'm not going to give you some choices that look a lot like glycerol that aren't. Right? It's either going to be glycerol or something that has nothing to do with triglycerides. And I probably won't give you options where, like, is it three fatty acids or two fatty acids or four? I probably won't do that either. So I guess the fact that there's three of them, that's a little bit less important. Anyway, what you have is a glycerol, a glycerol molecule joined with some fatty acids. And I'll show you a picture of it on the next slide. Any guesses to what kind of Shouldn't be a guess at this point. But can someone tell me the type of reaction that joins that glycerol molecule of the fatty acids? What's the name of that reaction? I know, I just thought it you on one day. It's a dehydration reaction. You need to know that for the exam. Remember, whenever you're building something, right, whenever you're putting parts together in this class, especially in this uh, chapter, it's called a dehydration reaction. Anyway, I'm going to put it next to. This, not because it's not important for you to know, but I'm not going to use one of the 50 questions on the exam to ask you about it. But let's talk about it anyway. Fatty acids, which are the things that attach to the glycerol molecule, they're long. They're energy rich, just like that picture I showed you on Monday that showed an octane, right? The gasoline. It showed you an octane molecule, and it showed you these molecules because they have an almost an identical structure, therefore, almost an identical function, which is to give you energy. Your book also points out that they have twice the energy of a carbohydrate, so it's a lot of energy, which is why fat is so good at storing energy, unfortunately for us. And it's also stored in adipose cells. So like I just did here, when I did that and said unfortunate for us to talk about being fat, when people say fat cells, that's also known as adipose cells. But again, big X to those three bullet points because you do not need to know that for the exam. So the next slide I'm going to show you shows you what it looks like. But are there any questions on this slide before I move forward? All right, let's do it. It's a down. Excuse me. It's a power not a PowerPoint. This is a video. So if you were to download the PowerPoint, you could click on it and watch this thing happening. But again, here's your glycerol molecule. Here's three fatty acids. These fatty acids all attached there. Each time that happens, it's a dehydration reaction because you're building something. Um, in this particular case, the fatty acids all look the same. But I will point out, we're going to talk about it a little bit more later, they don't always look the same. They're not always the same exact length. 
and have the same exact shape, but we'll, cut, we'll, we'll get there on this slide. There we go. This is also from your book. So this shows this one, right? It's not an animation, but here you can see this fatty acid is going to attach to that glycerol molecule, which squeezes out a water molecule, which makes it a dehydration reactor. Now here you can see these are slightly different, right? So these two fatty acids happen to both be completely straight, but this one happens to be longer than that one. And you can see this one on the third one here, it's not straight, right? It is at first, but then it curves down. And as you already know, even though you're not chemists, you can tell by looking, the fact that these things have slightly different structures tells you that they have slightly different functions, right? And also imagine if this was a key, if you will, because in a sense, uh, let's leave it that. Imagine that was a key, like that really was some big piece of metal. That thing is gonna fit into something different than something that would have three completely straight ones, right? It would just fit different. And that would be important later. So, let's take a guess. There are three essential functions of triglycerides, or fats. Anybody guess what they are? And one of them I've already kind of talked about, I just didn't say this is what it's for. But I did say it has twice, it's twice something than carbohydrates. Does anybody remember what I said? I said you didn't need to know of it. What did I say it has twice of? It? It's two times more what than carbohydrates? Fats. All right, well, let me ask you this. Why do you have fat? Why do we store fat on our bodies? You guys know this. Don't overthink it. Because that will give you all three answers. You guys, all right, well, why does a whale have fat on their bodies? They're really fat. The, the temperature. Temperature is one of them, yeah, right? So a whale, we think of whales more with that, right? That's why I'm glad I said whales, because it's also for, there for us. Technically, it's there to keep form, but... You know, humans these days, we can control our temperature because we have heat and air conditioner. But yeah, temperature is one of them. What's, uh, what's some others? Like, think, you guys know this. Maybe you're just afraid to say it. It's probably the number one answer. Like, why do you store fat other than temperature? Why is my belly getting big? You're eating a lot. Yep, I'm eating a lot, right? Yes. So then what's my body doing? Why is my body storing more energy? Good. Energy storage and temperature are the two things we talked about. And then, of course, this picture gives you a hint of a third, because if you look, I mean, that's fat. So right there at the bottom of your feet, you have fat. Also have a little bit more fat here than you usually do. You know, you have fat on your butt more than you do on other parts of your body. So that's a hint for the third one. Why do we have fat other than energy storage and temperature? So the more fat somebody has on their body, does that basically blow your well? Yeah, basically, yeah. You can probably find other functions too. It helps you float. I don't know if you've ever like, I don't know if you've ever been swimming when you're like kind of fat and then lose a bunch of weight and you go swimming again. He's like, you don't float as much. But anyway, that's a good question. But let's focus. We'll come back to the video. But let's focus. There's one more thing, one more reason why we have fat other than storing energy and temperature. And that's a hint. Protection. Protection is good enough. Sure. Cushion. Oops. Why did that show that? So yeah, you should know those things. I was hoping they were easy. Hopefully you did know that you guys just didn't want to say it for some reason. But surely, I thought everybody knew like you get fat and your body's trying to store energy. But also, yes, it helps insulate and also it's good for cushioning. So like keto, you're supposed to lose weight because instead of burning the carbs that you're not really supposed to eat, it's burning the fat instead of energy. Yeah. And also, that's a diet thing, but carbs aren't necessarily bad. Especially the good ones, like complex carbohydrates. Yes, they're bad if you're trying to lose weight, but they're not necessarily empty calories. Fat, depending on what kind of fat it is, could be good for you, could be bad for you. That's something we'll also talk about in this chapter. It's a complicated thing when we talk about diets. But yeah, that's exactly how keto works. You starve it of carbs, your body needs some energy, and guess what? That's what fat is, it's stored energy, so it takes it. Anyway, so know this for the example. And the next word for attendance, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to change it up. I'm going to circle it. So if anybody's at home watching the live lecture with their eyes closed and they're relaxing, which is fine as long as they're listening, but open up your eyes and look at the screen if you're, all, if you're online. Because that is the third word for attendance. Anyway, any questions about the essential functions 
of fats. Here we go. Here's where it gets a little bit complicated. I'm glad she asked the question she asked because it started to get started us in the discussion of diets. If a fatty acid, so again, that's those long strings that we attach to the glycerol molecule. If that fatty acid, any of them, has fewer than the maximum number of hydrogens, it is called unsaturated. Another way of saying this, very important bullet point that you will know for the exam. Circle it. Okay, you know this one. Another way of saying this is a saturated fat is saturated with hydrogen. So when we say something is saturated, we're talking about fats, that's what we mean, it's saturated with hydrogens. Like this one up here, you could not squeeze another hydrogen on there, right? That's as many as you can get, because the carbon can only bond four times. And each one of these is either bonded to another carbon or hydrogen. So it's as many as you can get. So definitely know the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats. There's going to be more. The first thing I just taught you was that, right? Saturated, completely saturated with hydrogens. Unsaturated is not. Another way of saying that, the reason the unsaturated fat is not completely saturated with hydrogens is because of this right here. It's not always like this. There's so many different shapes and lengths of unsaturated fats. With this one, you can see that that carbon is double bonded to that carbon. So instead of that one being having a, let me just draw it. Instead of this carbon being bonded to a hydrogen, like the rest of them, and this carbon being bonded to hydrogen. And you can't do that, right? Because as you know, carbon can only bond four times. So if I were to do that, that would be one, two, three, four, five, right? I can't do that. So instead, it's double bonded to the other carbon. Therefore, it's not saturated with hydrogens. Also, therefore, more importantly, and you'll see why later, it is no longer straight, right? It's crooked, it's kinked. That is important. So know that for the exam. Also know, because again, fatty acids, right, those are the individual things that are attaching to the glycerol. That's those things right there. But if we were to say something, a fat is saturated, like, all right, that's a saturated fat you're eating. What that means, that means all three of those uh, fatty acids that are attached to the glycerol molecule, all three of them are completely saturated. So all three are nice and straight. So why is this important? And if you're online, sorry, it's gonna be hard for you to see. But imagine you have a bunch of saturated fats. That's your glycerol molecule, three fatty acids. Glycerol molecule, three fatty acids. Right? And imagine, oh, draw some the other way. Why not? Glycerol molecule, three fatty acids. Imagine you had a bunch of these things, and I said, stack those things together. It'd be pretty easy, right? You just kind of slide them in there next to each other. You could stack them. Is it nice and straight, right? Could you picture that, even though you're not a chemist? Picture that as a actual molecule, or not a molecule, but like a model that big. That would be easy to stack, right? Now try doing that with, you know, something like this. And then maybe this one's like this. And then this one's, I don't know, like this. That would be a lot harder to stack, right? Because they've got all these wonky little shaped things. And because of that, they're not going to nice and neatly stick together. That is not trivial when we're talking about this whole thing of structure and function. That is the reason why saturated fats are unhealthy and unsaturated fats aren't healthy. Because saturated fats, which is not what I've drawn there anymore, because they're all nice and straight, it's nice and easy, it's easy to stack them together. Therefore, they kind of solidify at room temperature. So that's what makes your clog, your arteries basically clog up. They stack together nice and neat, which is bad, right? You don't want to clog your arteries. And your book points out, you should know this too, most animal fats are high in saturated fat. So for shorthand, just for studying purposes, you could put, you know, animal fat equals saturated fat. Not that all the fat in animals is saturated, but, you know, you get more saturated fat in animals than you do in plants. So there you go. Of course, there's a bunch of words for this medically. You don't need to know that for the exam. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to ask you about the fact that they easily stack because of that the solid room temperature. That's just for your own knowledge. That's just to help you remember the fact that saturated fats are bad for you. And now you know why, right? Anyway, any questions about that slide? All right, so 
if animal fats are high in saturated fat, then you might guess that plants have unsaturated fats. Also fish too. Of course, fish are a type of animal, but it should be known that fish fat and most plant fat is high in unsaturated fat. And for that reason, it's usually liquid at room temperature. Put it next to this too. You both points this out, but I don't, you don't need to know for the exam. Tropical plants are often the exception. So, you know, palm oil, things like that. But anyway, you don't need to know that. You should just associate animals with saturated fats other than fish. You should associate them with unsaturated fats and uh, plants with unsaturated fats. But we're almost done talking about the fats as far as diet is concerned, almost. This next slide, I think, is directly from your book, so I definitely want to point it out to tell you. Yes? Wait, so that on the board, mm -hmm. the things, are they unsaturated? Yep. Okay. Those are unsaturated because they have that kink in them, which I didn't draw it properly, but if you were to look right there, that would be a carbon double bonded to another carbon, which makes it change its shape. And that, again, that could be anywhere. You know, the kink could be here, the kink could be here, it could be more than one kink. You know, sometimes it's really long, sometimes it's really short. The more diverse it is, the harder it is to stack them, which means the better it is for you. So anyway, this next slide I think is from your book, but either way, I wanted to include it to tell you you don't need to know it for the exam. Right? I'm not, this is not a healthy nutrition class. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to ask you what percentage of corn oil is monounsaturated and polyunsaturated and saturated. Matter of fact, I haven't even talked about this because you don't need to know it for the exam. But really quick, just so you know, this would be monounsaturated because of the three, there's only one that's you know unsaturated. You don't need to know that. Polyunsaturated would be more than just one. If anything, and I'm like 98% sure I'm not going to do this, but if anything from this, I might give you this picture and then ask you a question. Not because you need to memorize it, but you should be able to decipher a graph. So if I give you this and say, you know, which of the following has the most saturated fat? Corn oil, palm oil, or butter? And you can just look and say, oh yeah, it's saturated fat. Or I mean, butter. Make sense? All right. <coughs> Um, another thing you don't need to know for the exam, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you anyway, because it's in the book, put a big X as a reminder. Food manufacturers often convert unsaturated fats to saturated, which is crazy, right? Because unsaturated fats are the healthy ones, and the saturated fats are the unhealthy ones. So why would they do that? Well, first of all, it makes it to where it doesn't spoil as quickly. Why? I don't have time to get into it. You can look it up for independent work if you want. How is it going from unsaturated to saturated? It makes it last longer. It's also good for frying. You can look that up too if you want for a different order. Why is it good for frying? Um, they can make things solid at room temperature. So you know you could take corn oil, a liquid, do hydrogenation, and then make it solid at room temperature, aka margarine. Right? Anyway, this process can also create trans fats, which are very bad for health. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna ask you that about, about that on the exam either. I think it's on the study guide, but I'm not gonna ask you. But yeah, you should know that just for your everyday life, right? Trans fats are very bad for your health. You can look that up, look into that for independent work. Why are trans fats so bad for you? Where do you usually find them? And the opposite of very bad um, fats, like trans fats, are these things. This is also not going to be on the exam, but again, very important for your everyday life. Omega-3 fatty acids, very, very healthy. They reduce heart, uh, heart disease, arthritis symptoms, irritable bowel syndrome, and they're usually found in oily fish and nuts. So like, uh, Tuna, salmon, and for nuts, like walnuts, I think are the best. You can look at it if you want. It's the best nuts. It's the best fish. How is omega-3 good for you? What makes it good for you? Any questions so far? All right. Again, nothing you need to memorize here, but the last word for attendance is going to be that thing right there, ice cream cone. So when we get back on Friday, hopefully we can finish this chapter up. Doesn't matter because we'll have a whole week after that to uh, get the, the exam. Anyway, if you want to stick around for the picture and you want to your credit, you can do. I guess it's meeting down the hallway. We'll go there. And if you don't have WBHU gear on, that are willing to take the picture for some extra credit, then that's it. I'll see you all on that.
Yeah. <laughs> 